So this next episode is really, really fun. Uh, and in a way, that word implies that we're goofing around and laughing a lot, but it, it's that's not really what's happening. We're having this really, really amazing conversation with this extremely well-educated and articulate and insightful woman. And for me to just sit there and listen to everything she says was super easy. Um, there's a little bit of back and forth between you and me about wanting to get our questions in as ed edgewise. I think we did really well. And, and I think it's very nice that we're at a point in our doing this together that we recognize, Oh, look, I just stepped on you. Oh, look, you just stepped on me. And we, it, it's a blip instead of like, Oh, now we got a thing. Right. That's right. Right. Absolutely. And it's well, well, man, this is one podcast that is just going to give you so, so much insight and awareness. This woman has written an amazing book and lived an amazing life. And um, I can't wait for you guys to hear it and see it if you watch it on, on the show. And by all means, please click subscribe and follow and send us an email, write a comment. Um, of course, keep it positive. We're about positive vibes here. And, you don't uh, have yeah. to. We're about freedom of speech, too. Yeah. You can talk shit. <laughs> you see, see, that's how this works. Greg can just openly disagree with me. But yeah, I, that at the end of our time with her, I was like, oh dear, we just scratched the surface. Like she really, it was just such an honor to be in the presence of, like you say, someone who's extremely well educated, has her own personal experience with her education. You know, it's not just academia and book reads, it's real life experienced and delved into. And wow. Expect to be challenged and uh, curious. Yeah, hopefully it opens a door to like, anyway. All right, here we are. Dr. Robin Spencer Antone. Sis, hello? Levin, 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 Levin. Monsieur Zicher Vegan Dem. Yo, you eat me, yo. Sitak, you benza. Amika, sit here. Two outlaws on the lam, taking the back roads through America. You can't drink enough coffee for this show. <laughs> and now it's time for Monday Madness with the Moped Outlaws, Greg and Mark. We are here with Dr. Spencer Antoine as our guest. And oh, you know what? We like having our guest on the top. <laughs> um, and um, I heard you speaking at College of Marin in California with Dr. Davis and was really impressed. One of the things that Mark and I have spoken about a lot, which is why I was, I'm, I got to say, I'm thrilled that you are spending time with us. I think both oh. Mark and I, are, like, I feel a bit like, I don't know if you're familiar with Wayne's World. Yes. <laughs> okay. Not worthy. Not worthy. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me, for having me. I apologize for the long lag sometimes in communications. Uh, you know, time just flies sometimes with so many things going on, but I would just happy to make time when i had time and this is it so thank you both for for showing up and for creating this space yeah we want to honor you and be in the gratitude of you making time to out of your busy schedule a professor an author and a wife and a mother to be with us and we are thrilled to be able to get to know you better and to ask you questions i wasn't able to read your whole book but i read some of it and i realized as i was doing that i was like wow you know i don't know how many podcasts you've done or how many lectures and interviews qa sessions you've done about the book and there's some amazing things we can talk about but i'm also aware that there's this human being who's had this life and how often do you tell that story? Cause not, I didn't see you in the book much. You're in there to describe some context in the introduction and stuff where you talk about how your husband died at the beginning of the process. And, and so my hope is that we can talk about all of it. Like um, my first question, if I might be so bold is sure. how did you decide to 
finish your education in the way that you did? What was it that had you move towards the degrees and that you achieved and become the professor that you are today? Thanks for asking that. And it is very true that oftentimes that doesn't get asked, you know, in these uh, moments. So thanks. I mean, I grew up in a family. Uh, my parents are immigrants from uh, Guyana in South America. So I was actually the first person in my family to be born in the U.S. So I grew up first generation in Brooklyn, New York. Wow. And I went to all public schools. And in high school, you know, we were those of us who I think had were considered sort of college bound. And, you know, I think that guidance counseling then as it is now kind of participates in this um, sort of tracking idea. So you encourage some, some you kind of don't encourage so much and some you actively discourage. So I was in the group of people um, that was encouraged to kind of look at colleges so I ended up going to college just a few hours north of where I lived in Brooklyn, um, upstate New York. So I went to the State University of New York at Binghamton. And there I, as a first generation college student, you know, my parents, there were only two jobs you came out with, you know, you were a doctor or a lawyer. And so <laughs> I thought I liked science. So I was pre-med in my first uh, year or so of college. But I took history classes as an elective because I always liked history. Um, I always found it to be really an interesting way of kind of looking at the world. And after a year of the science classes and after kind of being away from school and being upstate New York, which is a place that's uh, pretty conservative, it's, um, you know, a place where there were still I shouldn't say still because it's the case in 2023, white supremacist organizations, you know, making their home there. Um, it was kind of shocking for me as someone who'd grown up in Brooklyn where things were fairly diverse and you were shielded from the sort of the front lines of racial hate. Mm -hmm. So after a year there, I was like, wow, these history classes are helping me to understand the world, whereas the science classes to me became almost, you know, esoteric. I wasn't doing well in them anyway, I should <laughs> say. <laughs> so it was just time for me to move on. I became a history major and I didn't really know what one does with that. You know, um, teaching was a career that oftentimes was pointed out as something that was obvious that history majors did. So I veered towards teaching. I took a class on so women and social movements. And that class was really, really eye-opening. I mean, I read about all these amazing women and, and how they, you know, organized and mobilized people and the changes that were made as a result of it, the visions they had, the dreams, the whole thing. And I was like, wow, this is what I want to study. And before that, I was studying U.S. foreign policy. So it was kind of a little bit of a shift for me. Mm -hmm. I was like, yes, yeah, social movements is the thing. Mm -hmm. And I had read about the Black Panther Party in that class through an autobiography of Asada Shakur. Mm -hmm. And um, if you haven't read it, Asada by Asada Shakur, tremendous piece of literature, tremendous piece of nonfiction, just a tremendous work um, in so many ways. So I read that and I was all in to learn more about the Black Panther Party. I read everything I could read and then it was over. You know, this is pre kind of wide scale Internet. You know, I'm, I started college in uh, 1987. So when you got to the end of your information circ cycle, that was it. There wasn't a whole world to explore. And I was like, wow, I really wish that I could learn more. There needs to be more. And then I just got the idea, that, you know, I could write more. You know, it feels kind of outlandish now to look back and say, oh, yes, I can write a book, you know, my 19 year old self. Um, but I felt it was possible. And so I kind of decided to continue my education in that vein. So that's what motivated me. I had motivators along the way. I had people who felt like it wasn't going to be a great topic or it was a dangerous topic because these were radical people. And you know, maybe I wouldn't get a job. Maybe I wouldn't be taken seriously. Maybe I wouldn't, you know, advance along the path of success. But I always felt like, you know, I wanted to write about the Black Panther Party because as a political commitment, 
And um, so I felt people needed to know about an organization like that, and in particular, the role of women in it. So that simple premise is where I started and what kind of kept me going uh, throughout the long writing process and revisions. It's interesting that you mentioned how some people express their concern about your well-being as you chose this important path for yourself. And I immediately reflected on how this is the conditioning of capitalism that has people being pushed into their roles instead of actually being able to expand into the areas of our own level of social change and and being a uh, motivation and being a force for good and so i just noticed that in your story that you had to overcome pressure you know and fear and and right away that's another indicator of the way this system works to sort of restrict uh, people yes and it's important to note that those people position themselves as allies they were doing me a favor it's one thing to sort of see the big big barricades up against you um, coming from forces that you would expect to be um, against social justice, against this kind of knowledge getting out. But to see it coming from people under the guise of protection um, is a whole other thing. And that's what I realized about the topic, that it it brought out detractors from all different um, circles, including circles that you might have assumed would be your allies. Yeah. When you were 19, did you know that the Black Panther Party was still uh, viable and active? I did. I did. I was actually, um, well, I was 19. Yeah. Well, when I was 19, not so much, I guess I would say. They, it seemed like recent history around that same time is when Huey Newton was killed. I mean, I was born in 1970, so I'm 19, it's 1989, and Huey Newton is killed. And so there's a lot of write-ups in the newspapers and things like that about who was this organization. Oh, look, Huey Newton killed around drugs. This is a sign of the uh, insignificance of this group. Yeah, I remember the All media these years later. So it was I mean, I knew that there was a lot the Panthers were still around that and that there was a lot of conversation about who they were, but there was a lot of differing opinions and it was around the same time as the Malcolm X movie. It felt like a moment where people were just becoming more interested, more invested in the radical sixties to try to have a different and alternative vision of what that was. Well that kind of leads into something I'm interested in, but before diving into that, I still right now don't 100% know if the Black Panther Party is active today. Mm -hmm. They are active. They are active. I mean, there's, they're active in different ways, right? And again, there's not a lot of political consensus. So on the one hand, you have people who are veterans of the original Black Panther Party, which started in 1966 in Oakland, California, in places like New York. It started in New York even before Oakland. Um, but that organization, they're veterans of that organization who are incarcerated still and considered political prisoners who every year have a reunion. Like every year in Oakland, California, there is Panther History Month. There is Bobby Hutton Day. There are you, know, you will go there and you will see elders who are Panthers who are still doing the thing, who are still giving away food, who are still raising matter. awareness, right. who are okay. still That's you know, doing their thing okay. under the banner of their association and lifelong commitment to the Black Panthers. There's also the new Black Panther Party, which I think has a different genealogy. And um, I don't know if that's still active. There's a couple of Panther legacy groups and inspired by groups, but sometimes there's tensions there because they may not always reflect what some believe are kind of the spirit of the original um, Black Panther Party, but certainly organizations have come along and utilize the name, but it's really the Black Panther Party. There's a It's About Time website. There's the National Alumni Association of the Black Panther Party. And people don't know that you can, that it's not, unfortunately, it should be a big deal to meet a Black Panther because they should be held up as, you know, our freedom fighters, our heroes, but they might be that elder that you brush by that you don't think has anything to offer. They may have that story of what they did in their heyday youth or what they're still continuing to do today to offer. So there are lots of Black Panthers out here. 
What struck me in your introduction is you at the table and you see that woman who's obviously of the streets go in and get her bottle of liquor for the day, mm-hmm. walk by the table and then go, oh, you're Black Panthers. We need you mm-hmm. and give you some of her money. That That is the um, education I received from what I was able to read of your book and also listen to some of the interviews you did when it was published of what the Black Panthers are, because I definitely was raised with them as being a radical armed militant group. Mm -hmm. And even like you talk about gender quite a bit in your book and from listening to what you were saying at College Marin, I was raised that um, it was a very misogynistic group. Mm -hmm. For sure. I mean, there were so many, it was a misogynistic group. Yes, there were there were so many misogynistic groups. And the question for me is, well, how did black women navigate that? To what extent were they malleable, even more malleable than other misogynistic groups, which which might be filled with people of, you know, religious constituencies and things like that. Right. I mean, it was a misogynistic time, but women in particular and their allies, you know, because they were male allies who were down with feminism and uh, rooting for women's uh, liberation in key ways. And there were women who were rooting against that. So it wasn't just a male female dichotomy or dynamic, but thinking about how women um, stepped up and how the Panthers inadvertently even uh, provided that platform for women to say, hey, hey, what about our kids? What about education? What about Birth, let's talk birth control. You know, these these kind of topics that um, are so important, but sometimes they're not seen as like the political topics of what the Panthers did. Like what the important thing they did are supposed to be marches and um, campaigns that we can see, but not per se how they lived, what they tried to change inside of people. And I think that to me, that was just as important as anything they did outside of people, you know? Hmm. So question, as you become more and more aware of them and you run out of materials in the library in upstate New York to discover, there's some sort of curiosity fire that gets lit that has you go on this quest that underpins the nature of this book. What were the cultural factors in your own experience? What was your life like that had you want to know more and connect more with the Black Power movement? Well, I was someone who, like I said, my parents are from the Caribbean, they're from Guyana. And I grew up with uh, hearing a lot about people like Walter Rodney. So I was like aware of this ideal of the guerrilla intellectual, the person who used writing to, you know, as a freedom tool. Right. So I, my deal about my writing was not so much that it was to get me advancing in the world of academia or to, Um, gain prestige, but it was to sort of put tools in the hands of people so that they can learn from, so they can grow from, so they could criticize, you know, this history um, that is so, so important. So that was something that I sort of came from. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, which is a very kind of nationalist kind of place in terms of its politics. I grew up going to where Black Solidarity Day, for example, the day before Election Day was like a big thing. Like people would talk about anyway, not going into work, not going to schools, Black Solidarity Day. There was always events at at Medgar Evers College that you could go to and listen listen to. It felt like there was kind of, there was a movement of brewing. And I'm thinking about things like the Central Park Jogger case. And I'm thinking about the anti-apartheid movement. And, you know, there was just a sense in the 90s that it was a renewed sense of possibility for social change. I feel like we're here again um, today in the, you know, but I think the 90s were, were that kind of moment. And for me, it felt like, wow, this is possible. Um, I remember going to Medgar Evers College where I became a volunteer. It's a city university, part of the city university of New York. And um, I became a volunteer at the Center for Women's Development. I went to programs where I heard 
like the new Black Panther Party speak. I heard the Black Panther Collective speak. And I got a chance to really discern, like, what is this legacy of this organization? And to have a sense that these are still ongoing issues. I mean, Rodney King, um, the things that we saw on television that felt shocking, like you couldn't have told but me who watch Rodney King, that we would be here in 2023 where we have seen an overwhelming preponderance of, you know, recorded and televised, you know, violence and black death as spectacle, you know, um, in our, you know, in our media, social media, et cetera. So there was in the 1990s that sense of like possibility, like this is, you know, people are churning up this past again and they're looking for answers and people are interested enough to watch a Malcolm X movie for a Malcolm X movie to be like on the big screen and for, you know, apartheid and the questions about segregation, and everything to become like, you know, front page news. And it felt like my writing could kind of intervene in that. So I feel like there was, I was kind of primed to do that. And I felt like I had to kind of overcome, um, a sense that I wasn't the person to do it right. Um, you know, I'm a New Yorker. I'm writing about Oakland. Um, I didn't really know a lot about California in a visceral way. I mean, when you go to California, you're like, oh, this is someplace else. You know, um, when you're in New York, you don't quite get like what those differences may be. You may read about them, but it's until you land there and you're like, oh, OK, I, I see the South here. I see the counterculture here. I see, you know, all of these intertwined histories here on this ground. I see radical Asians. I see the Pacific here. Like I had to really learn the Bay Area, learn the Panthers part of California to be able to represent that in the book. And, you know, like I said, there was the sense, well, is this the right person to be doing this. I'm a woman, first of all. I'm coming from New York, second of all, you know, and, um, you know, I guess even my demeanor, you know what I mean? Like, I think people have a preconceived notion. So I love Angela Davis because she's so fiery, but she's in her own way, right? Everybody is not um, the Malcolm X type of speaker, the Dr. King type of speaker, the, the you know, whatever people have preconceived about how people should talk, how they should carry themselves, how they should dress, how they should, you know, all of this kind of stuff. Um, could I do it? Could I, as a, you know, woman who was, um, I guess, lower middle class kind of represent this very gritty working class proletarian history in a way that would do it justice. So I really tried to be aware from that. That's why I started with that story because a lot of times people who are writing about these movements and these people, they're not in their lives, you know, right? like in there, like <laughs> on yeah. the level with them yeah. riding the buses and seeing the stuff and, you know, understanding what people are. So that was like my introduction of like, whoa, you know, there's something going on here in this community where the Panthers could make someone who is, you know, in, in the throes of all of this, take out their precious funds <laughs> and donate it to this cause. Oh, um, well, one question, what personality traits about yourself did you discover that gave you the strength to write the book that you did? It's a good question. I think one of, one of the things about me is that I grew up without a lot of praise. If you look on social media today, you will find all sorts of memes and skits about, you know, the, the parents who are, you come in with the 98 and they're like, where's the two points? You know, like this kind of thing. There's never any sort of pats on the head or anything like that. And I kind of grew up in that environment for better, or for worse. My parents did what they could, what they knew. They loved me how they knew to love me. And I felt um, loved, but I never felt like I was, um, I just felt like I had to fight or, or earn what I got. And I think that made, when people were like, mm, I don't know if that's a great research topic. I wasn't dependent on those people's opinions or anything. Um, I just believed like inside of myself 
in myself and I just kept going with it, feeling like, well, I'm in now, you know, I'm in now and I'm just going to be doing this to the best of my ability. And, you know, I think that not needing that external validation because academia sometimes, oftentimes does not provide that. Like now the Panthers is like a great topic for people and all sorts of scholars are writing on the history of the Black Panther Party from all sorts of institutions. I mean, right now, I'm on a fellowship at Harvard University on Black Power, right? So Harvard is, you know, providing resources and space for people to commune around and research and share knowledge around Black Power. That would not have been the case um, in the past where it did feel like this is the fringe, you know, but I felt like I could be okay on the fringe. Like I'm not looking for... I wasn't looking for like any sort of accolades um, or platforms. You know, I'd always, I think, been told that it's kind of an each one teach one kind of thing. You're Mm -hmm. advancing Mm -hmm. to advance the community, never as an individual kind of thing. And I think that, you know, those kind of values just helped me to keep keep on even throughout my career where I felt like sometimes you really do just have to believe in yourself. No one is out here thinking you're the brightest bulb or that you deserve X, Y, or Z. You just kind of have to keep going because, you know, I write about the left. I write about, you know, the poor. (laughs) I write about, you know, women and people that, you know, many people may feel are less important than presidents and, you know, other, you know, entities and formations or even moments in history that are um, perceived as more, more central. Mm. And so I think that kind of self-assurance has kind of been a trait that has allowed me to persevere and also to keep just, um, just to keep, I guess, uh, a critical eye when these things do become part of the mainstream and to question like, why now, you know, Um, why now, why now are we so invested in, you know, the Malcolm X, like when Twitter became X, for example, and people had to come out and say, hey, we remember when X was the symbol that meant you saw the Malcolm X movie, (laughs) and you know, it was associated with your, you know, it was a pop culture thing. It was commodification, yes, but it was also like some kind of statement. And now it's 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 totally it's totally something else. So I think that kind of having that perspective helps you to navigate the moments when your topic is, you know, considered um, irrelevant, and moments where your topic is considered to be the cutting edge. Understanding that those moments can change at any time. I want to ask. A question Wait. now, if I may, Greg. This All is part right. of the game we play. Greg and I are like both <laughs> super interested in asking questions. We have to, we have to be good with each other. There, Mark. Right? But, but one of the things that's occurring to me as I hear about your personal evolution, which is the thread I'm sort of carrying in this conversation, is that in your bio, I read that you described yourself as a womanist. And I'm aware of the distinction between feminism and womanism. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, because not a lot of people are aware of that distinction. And if you could anchor that to anything in your own personal history or in the black power movement yourself, that is part and parcel to how that definition arose. Sure. Thanks for, for bringing that out. Um, you know, the feminist movement belong in a lot of ways to black women, right? At the turn of the century after emancipation, uh, at least on paper, you know, African-American women and their allies determined a way forward for the black community that would be egalitarian, that would sort of center um, women's work alongside men, not ahead of men, not behind men either, but to think about egalitarianism. Now, that is the root of what would become black feminism. And black feminism would have many strands from the left feminisms, the ones, you know, the critics of capitalism, and things like that. Now, of course, mainstream feminism evolved out of their own understanding, uh, centered more in uh, thinking about the exclusions that women faced, 
and not necessarily having that critique of power mm. that was found in a black feminism. So as a result of that, there was a real alienation around the term feminist um, in the, you know, in the lives of many um, African American uh, women who were who were activists. And so as a result, the term womanism grew out of a different understanding of the relationship or the understanding of what feminism uh, is, right? Thinking about feminism as something that is connected to freeing people, freeing individuals, lowering barriers, um, having a critique of racism, imperialism, capitalism and power sort of embedded in it. Uh, Alice Walker, I think, helped popularize the term, but she didn't say that womanism was like this uh, whole scale critique of feminism. She, she used a phrase something like womanism is to feminism as lavender is to purple. Mm. And this idea that it was a, just another type of feminism is a way of thinking about feminism in a way that would center um, black women's particular and unique uh, critiques. So on Twitter and on social media, I used, I decided when, back when I joined all those many moons ago, that I would use the um, name race womanist because I felt, I wanted to play on several things. Like there was a term called a race woman. These were people who were um, active at the turn of the century, who were very much sort of advocates for their community. And then there's a term in the Caribbean, womanish, which kind of means that you are being um, sort of bigger than yourself, right? It's just sometimes used as a put down, but sometimes women claim it too, right? I'm being womanish. Um, so to me, race womanist kind of draws upon all of that. The ideal of womanism is this um, different way of thinking about feminism, the ideal of race woman, and the ideal of being womanish um, as well. Thank you. Is there something that in particular that differentiates womanism and feminism? I think that um, for feminists who are focused on, I guess, a critique of, of men and patriarchy solely as their platform, I feel like womanism is trying to move beyond that. It has a critique of patriarchy. But like I said, it also has a critique of racism and all of that. Because as you could imagine in the emerging feminist movement in the 1960s, you have people who are very critical of the role of men, but less critical or willing to look in the mirror and talk about the role of race and racism. And I do think like today, when you think about um, the way that women who are critical of the carceral state who consider themselves to be feminists, don't see prison as the answer for male violence, for example. Um, I think womanism allows you to make those distinctions um, in very key ways. I'm wondering if women is, well, I remember when I read Bell Hooks for the first time and I was like, oh, finally a conversation taking place. Like this is the conversation that I've been looking for. Does womanism tend to have more empathetic energies involved with its course of study where feminism seems to be more logical and kind of cut and dry? Not per se. I feel like womanism, um, there's a really great article about black feminism and love. Womanism and black feminism are kind of used um, in the same sort of vein. I do think that um, womanism, by centering the experiences of women of color and, and Black women in particular, it does give it a more expansive reach. Um, it, I feel like it can go to more places. It can get to the heart of more things rather than the male-female dichotomy or yeah, things like structural capitalism and patriarchy's yeah. origins in certain let's just say religious organizations for the moment mm -hmm. sure. it's also reflective of 
a pattern that occurred with the Me Too movement where black women were leading from a place of non-awareness where most white people were not aware of, you know, this issue. And then there was an explosion of it in the press. And then there was this element of co-opting that happened to the Me Too movement where its originators were sort of pushed to the side a little bit uh, or not just a little bit. Yeah. Um, and also the class issue. I think womanism is concerned with class, you know, um, women who wanted to get into the workplace, for example, is a feminist issue or equal pay is a feminist issue. What about the women who work in homes who aren't in the same structure? What about the women who leave the home to work, but then employ women in the home in a, you know, in a marginalized way to do the type of care work that they would be doing and exploit those women, right? So how do we think about, I think that womanism invites more complications in, it invites mm -hmm. more of a look at the root of society, a look at, even a look in the mirror. Wow. Um, well, shoot, the look in the mirror, that's the big challenging one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So we'll walk past the hornet's nest. And uh, <laughs> I'm one, one of the things that really attracted me to hearing you was you speaking about positive communities of protest and how those are formed. Mm -hmm. And it, that comes up with Mark and I quite a bit. I would love to hear what insights you have to the tools of as an individual in being a part of a positive community of protest? That's a good question. Um, I would imagine that I'm just a regular person. Let's say I'm not part of any real organization, but I wanna get involved in something. Let's say it's Palestinian liberation, right? Um, how do I get involved? Sometimes it may feel easier to reach out to a group and be a member than to actually turn to your partner, parent, <laughs> you know, in the immediate neighbors and talk to them about the new insights or to start a study group or things like that. So I think that protests can start with education, right? Or even that doesn't education doesn't have to be like this step that we stay in. Cause I think that people get turned off by that. Like, oh, I don't want to be in a study group. We're just studying. But you would be amazed how many groups, like people in the Bobby Seale were in study groups, like how many organizations like had a study component or an educational component or read together or something in addition to whatever work they did out there in the world. So step one might be to inform oneself more. Step two might be to find out what Palestinians themselves are doing and what they're calling for people who are aligned with them to do, right? So what is it that they want allies to do? And it may, of course, the Palestinian community is not one community, so you may find a host of things, right? And then what works for your particular group um, to take on? And then not just in the world though, but like in your lives, like just making a choice about boycotting something, for example, and slowly sharing that with people is, is, is central. It's, a, you know, we have to fight the state and that is for sure. But I think we also have to try to prefigure the world that we want to see. And part of that is being bold enough to challenge our people in our circles um, to think twice about what they are what they are doing, even if they continue to do it. At least you have encouraged them to kind of uh, try to make a change or to bring in uh, something different. So, for example, if you are boycotting, you know, some product that gets made in. Um, Palestine with exploited labor, you know, I think that's, that's something to, to think about. And also I find that um, there's a way that these protests can be so interwoven that we don't understand, like, 
you know, thinking about the geography of Palestine, thinking about the colonization is something that happens to people, but also to land, to crops, you know, to all of that and to imagine it, it almost brings in an environmental dimension. I feel like it can be a space in which you can deepen an analysis and then broaden it in a way too. Um, to things like the land, to the Water. culture. Like I'm writing about a woman and she was interested in, uh, she was protesting against the Vietnam War and she read poetry by the Vietnamese people. Like that was something that she did. She shared that with people. She mm. wanted to learn about the literature um, about that place. She made sure she knew about it and could map it, that kind of thing. These days we we, we can't even sometimes pick out the places we're in solidarity with on a map because they're not like a real geographical place for us. And then we tend to want to be over there with it. But what about thinking through what you can do in community with people who are where you are? I have a question about this idea of dismantling the state. I mean, we've got a, a real obvious perpetrative sort of systemic issue, right? And we can talk about the nuances of that. There's a lot of that's just obvious. The question I have is really about given how there's this impetus to break it down or tear it down or, or, or who are the current visionaries that you're aware of who are architecting a new possibility for humanity? What kind of vision do you have access to you and your circle of people where they're coming up with ideas about how to reform society? And what are some of those ideas? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I struggle with this because I do feel that sometimes we spend a lot more time and we're, we're incentivized to kind of tear things down versus build things up. That's why I like as a historian to look at moments of possibility and collective organizing, not so much at what the state has done. I find there's a lot of positive energy around reimagining prisons Mm. And to think differently about crime and punishment and rehabilitation and safety and how we can all be together. And even I find that that dovetails with how do we treat um, domestic abuse? How do we um, help people who might be in mental health crises? How do we imagine those things outside, which have been placed in that kind of carceral box, which has been... We, we, the solution has been to lock them up. Um, how do we broaden our notions of community and what gets opened when we think beyond the prison? And to me, that is really exciting. It's an exciting place mm -hmm. because I feel like it makes it very real and tangible because of course, I mean, if you're in a marginalized community and you are, safety is your number one concern, sometimes, you know, you may live in a community where safety is not your number one concern. Like you may not think that when I get out of my house to get from here to go to the bank, like I'm, I'm not in jeopardy, at, you know, as I'm walking through what I'm wearing, all of that might be taken from me. If you're in that context, right, I think it's really key to kind of think about safety. Like what does it mean to be safe? And I love the conversations that I see happening um, around that, beyond the sense of, I guess, that look, glance in the mirror and the personal transformation and the ability to forgive and to, um, I guess, seek reparations, seek repair, but beyond that to kind of think about, in a bigger sense, like where are these moments that we have seen perhaps in the past, that we have seen in moments or in particular places and spaces where we can say that, yeah, that seemed to work or that, you know, that had a positive outcome. And how can we sort of amplify those things so that it doesn't just feel like a ripping down, but also a building up, right? I find there's a lot of energy around that. I also see that around this question of care and the role of care and capitalism and um, how do we value the work that people do to allow all of the other work 
to happen, right? Um, the work that we might consider domestic labor and things like that. How do we reimagine labor in a way that includes and compensates and respects all of the type of labor that goes on to make society run? We saw a little, there was a moment in the pandemic when these sort of e the idea of essential workers came out like these who, who's essential really is it the, the big guy with the big job in the suit or is it the person that's like ringing you up and and getting you from point a to point b it was a moment right you know that quickly the phrase became something else but there was kind of this understanding where those people became visible as key parts of labor right oftentimes far away from unionization far far away from um collective activity and it just seemed to provide or just open up a new space to think about different potential you know i'm wondering in your study have you seen what dilutes phrases like um uh me too and uh, I just forgot the term for worker, you know. I, oh, the essential uh, worker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, essential worker, thank you. As, as you both mentioned during the course of this conversation, these were terms that had power and really meant something very wonderful to the roots of humanity. And then they were, they were diluted. And have you, in your studies, seen what energy is involved with that dilution of something. Mm -hmm. I have, because I feel like I said with black power, even with, um, I guess even with someone like Malcolm X, you know, with the Malcolm X stamp and all of this, you really see that co-optation is almost like, one of the key things that sort of uh, dilutes and transforms movement sometimes is that element of success. Like we succeeded, we, we're there, right? People are talking about this, but oftentimes it's about, I guess it's about understanding what true power is because I feel like what happens that people get seduced by this idea of proximity to power, right? Or an individualized notion of power like we we have overcome because we can go and buy the Malcolm X hat or use the Malcolm X stamp and things like that. But yet there's comes with a it comes with a concerted move to move a Malcolm X out of the curriculum. Right. So mm -hmm. that they just become like this sort of empty shell. And there's kind of an emptying that happens. I think it's what it's just, I think it's a strategy of the state to transform an empty radical vessels from their revolutionary potential. And it is also the, it's not just the state. I want to say that it's also those who buy into that, right? Who will accept the diluted version because Maybe they're thirsty for something and it may look like a positive change. Like I remember when I couldn't find anything for about Malcolm X. Now I can buy him, you know, buy a stamp. Now I'm not demonized for wearing his hat and things like that. Rather than saying, what do I know about Malcolm X? Why has he become a meme in the information age, right? Where, that we're in now where you don't have right. to have a boss, a bottomless, yeah, see, you know, like a bottom floor to your knowledge acquisition. At any moment, we can go out here and find out about what's happening with the radical left in the Philippines. We can find out what's happening on the ground in Morocco. We can find out, you know, so many things just by typing things into Google and consuming them. Why are we, why do we accept this thimble full of knowledge around someone who is as complex as a Malcolm X, why do, even if we know that this is coming from consumer society, why don't we, for example, read more back to my thing about 
education. I do find that there are quite a few activities in 2023 that's meant to distract us from um, the kind of self-knowledge that seemed to be um, a quest for people in earlier waves of social movements, um, the study group, the the books, like the Fanon, like it, what you know, look at the books that were like the Red Book, Fanon, you know, all of the books, the autobiography of Malcolm X, like the, the Bibles of the previous movement. Um, I get suspect when movements don't seem to be drawing from this kind of base and maybe books are old fashioned, um, but I don't even see like blog, particular blogs or particular, you know, um, periodicals, the way one could point to monthly review press and, you know, the, 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 the spaces in the past that were there. The neuroscience of saturation of media saturation has us literally with too much dopamine happening from things that are not really relevant to moving things forward. And so one of the a radical act now is literally decon deconnect disconnecting from information overload. And then in that void, you can develop an appreciation for what are really important core aspects of how we got to move this thing forward together. And, and that's, I think, an, a conscious and intentional way that the incarceration industrial complex is continuing to put mm -hmm. barriers to, you know, the creation of a new paradigm for us. I have a question. I'm wondering, do you think the Black Panther Party founders created a mission statement that allowed them to continually check in and make sure that as they were growing and becoming international, they were course correcting to remain on point with their intention and mission. Not so much. I mean, they had political education and I think that was a space for people to kind of come together or think together and read. But one of the things that they one of the realities of political repression is it constantly put them on the back foot, as they might say, right? They were constantly like in the fence mode, um, whether it be fighting court cases, dealing with people's mm -hmm. arrests, um, mobilizing against negative propaganda. Now you can being look murdered. at their newspaper being murdered, trying to save their lives. Yeah. Um, or, you can look at the newspapers as a site where they're constantly, on a, you know, putting out a vision. And I think that that's what I would point to. So how do you keep your own hope alive moment to moment? Like you mentioned the prison system, that there's an area of a lot of light and positive things going on. It's also, for me, when I look at it, an area of immense energy to keep it as it is and perhaps even grow it in the wrong direction. How do you keep your hope alive? Well, it gets back to me being a parent. You know, I have an 18-year-old who is off in college and, you know, sort of see her go through her Rodney King moment, we can say, right, of like, I can't believe what I'm seeing. I can't believe this is possible. But then to have like a swell, you know, m millions of people to join with even briefly in the streets, I think just imagining the ways and the tools that I feel like young people today have, I think gives me hope because I feel like there's a synergy in their tools and our tools um, where we kind of need each other in some ways, right? They've got one way of approaching or many different ways of approaching. And I think coming together and learning from older methods, improving on those things. Um, one of the things I'm writing about now is um, this idea of self-care and just sort of showing up to a movement whole. Mm and realizing how many broken people do show up in movements and the harm that they can perpetuate even within those spaces because of that. 
And I think now there is more, I see more of a calling out or calling in of people within movements whose behaviors I think would have been tolerated um, and accepted in the past. So young people keep me generally hopeful. I see the ability to weave together protest strands. I see the ability to reach out globally. I find that to be so key. And I especially like organizations that remain face to face that do the occasional social media hiatus and, you know, the, who valued the ability to just keep things connected on a human level and build trust that way. Because of course it's very difficult. You know, this think the reality of political repression is real. One can almost assume that. I mean, look at the world we're living in so different from the world that was there in the 60s, just in the level of the camera, camerification of everywhere, right? Um, what does it mean to be in a public space to have quote unquote privacy? Like what, what does all of this mean? How have we consented to our own surveillance um, in a way? And so there's kind of a interesting synergy between today's understanding of that and the lessons and legacies of, of people who were around in the 60s and 70s, a generation, by the way, who are in their 70s and 80s now. Right? So, yeah. <laughs> Do you think that perhaps the fact that it's so much more over the deprivacy of our current life, that there's a positive to that? Because mm -hmm. maybe back in the 50s and 60s, it was still happening, but no one was really having it in conversation. And nowadays, it's a very common conversation. Is there a positive to that? I definitely think so. I mean, I see movements kind of jumping off in, in, in internet spaces or starting from social media spaces, which is great. I do feel, again, that there is a way that things like commodification, things like, you know, this, 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 you know the, the song, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised, and like what Jill, Bill Scott Heron was trying to tell us back then, I do feel we need a little bit of that because I feel like um, this ideal of, I think he said, turning on, tuning in and dropping out. Many people have done that out of politics because of just the way that popular culture has become depoliticized and not something that will propel someone into activism that would in fact incentivize you just to stay in your couch isolated from <laughs> from anyone else yeah right that's a real you know goal of, of some of it so it's very hard for me intellectually to understand why i should engage with any energy in a system where one of our foremost uh forerunners as president and leader of the country is got a mugshot and is being I don't get it you know I don't and the fact that I've heard and again this is part of what's very difficult with media for me is I heard his popularity went up when that mugshot was um, you know seen in the media I don't know if that's real or not. So that's one thing I kind of wonder, step back and go, well, am I emotionally reacting to real information? Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, if it is, <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> yeah, these are really, I mean, the, these are times like I would have never imagined. Um, the quick swing from sort of those statements of solidarity and, you know, anti-racism to let's get, let's ban books and get them out of schools. It's, you know, yeah, I feel like I'm still grappling and trying to look in history to try to understand, you know, um, these moments. What I do know is that people survived these, horrible downturns and that collective organizing continued and so yeah yeah 
I do find solace in that, that I think the United States of America is a world power. And historically, we can see world powers rise and fall and the people continue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For sure. You mentioned that you're writing a little bit about different subjects now, and I want to know more about where that's yeah. taking you. Sure, sure, sure. Well, the Panther work took me to the movement against the U.S. war in Vietnam because I felt like so many Panthers were veterans or were coming out of, you know, or dealing and coping with the draft as they were, you know, doing their organizing work. And I just found that there is a miscomprehension of the anti-war movement that doesn't really talk about what it meant in the Black communities. Um, of this country. So that's what I'm interested in writing about now, which is the movement against the U.S. war in Vietnam, um, a collective biography of many different people, some who were blues musicians, some who were poets, some who were political activists, some who were soldiers themselves, um, to try to think about what did it mean to be against the war? How did people um, try to imagine another way of being in the world, um, you know, in this time period? So that's one project. I'm also writing about um, Patricia Murphy Robinson, who was a social worker, a counselor, who was involved in um, the women's movement, the new left. And through her therapy, she really helped people to understand the relationship between their, what they experienced as personal problems and capitalism. Mm. And the way that capitalism mm. impacted the family, um, the way that patriarchy impacted the family, those kinds of things. So I'm really interested in that because it allows me to think about the personal political and the ways in which I think people don't understand that people who were around the 60s and 70s did seek counseling. I think we're at a moment now where counseling has kind of come out of the shadows of just a little bit. It's not as demonized as it, as it once was. And it feels almost like a new thing, but of course it's not a new thing. There were people who were involved in the 60s and 70s who had the traumas of political involvement who tried to do something about that. So her life will help me to tell, you know, that part of the story. What did it mean to be a movement activist and, you know, everything that people went through emotionally, spiritually to be part of it um, and how one person tried to help people navigate yeah. And I just caught um, perhaps uh, an insight into your passion with history is it allows you to voice positives for the present moment. Like, yes. look, historically, this happened and this individual really did this. You, too, have this at your disposal. Yes, I feel like history is a powerful mirror. That's why I gravitate towards the people who resisted, um, who fought against the odds, who spoke back to times that felt so oppressive um, that it was almost unimaginable, but they still did it anyway, so. Did you, are your parents, it, you said something earlier that has me believing your parents were academic thinkers without having gone through academia. They were individuals of, mm -hmm. um, looking within and without and examining things. Is that true? Yeah, I would say that my parents were, I mean, my mom, for example, she had a clerical job at a hospital. She didn't go far in higher education, but she had, let's call it an everyday critique of things. And she would come home and talk to the air about, you know, what had happened to her and what she saw. And you would hear it like, okay, this this person, why they tell me, you know, you're like, okay, it just gives you a sense of power dynamics and, you know, race and just discrimination and everything. And my dad was more of someone who was interested in like formal politics. So Walter Rodney and, um, you know, all of that kind of stuff. But Muhammad Ali, he was a big fan of, um, you know, in his anti-war stance as him as a political figure, not just sports figure that kind of thing. So I, I did kind of get that um, from my parents as well. From this book you're working on, was Muhammad Ali's viewpoint um, very, like that viewpoint 
was um, popular in the sense like, why am I going to fight a people who have done nothing to me? You have done a lot to me. Well, I'm not going to fight your war. Is that a very popular viewpoint you find? It became a popular viewpoint. I mean, the person that I start with who um, eventually became the first black soldier to refuse induction, he, when he was drafted, he went feeling like, well, what choice do I have, right? This was early, 65. Um, but then over time, he realized he did have a choice, right? He went and he found other soldiers who had similar opinions and he learned and he grew, et cetera. So there was definitely the people who saw the military as opportunity, as um, an authority you didn't defy. But then of course, over time, especially as you do have all the authority and popularity of a Muhammad Ali, um, raising the question of, you know, we're dying in America. Why would we go and, and harm other people, you know, for America? You know, and I think that has something that was being asked of almost every war the U.S. was part of, <laughs> World War II, all of them, you know, segregated military, the whole thing, right? Um, so, but him asking it at that moment, I think, did kind of help to grow, um, grow a movement or reflect the mood. His credibility as a literal warrior really made, gave that momentum. It really, you know, was a big stake in the ground for people to rally around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering sure. if there's someone close to you, a personal mentor who you would like to call out as having helped you really stay on the path that you're on. Is there someone who really created a big impact in your life besides your parents who has kept you moving in the direction you're going? Sure. I want to call out Sophia Bandelli. Um, she's my godmother, although she didn't come to me in the traditional way the godmothers come to people. But I, I met her uh, as the head of the Center for Women's Development at Medgar Evers College. And she was the first person who I felt like she she just kind of got into people's space and faces. Like if there was a problem, like she would literally go and try to solve it. Like she would go to group homes and, you know, talk to people there. And I became sort of her protege. I just would, was so amazed by her. She also, I should say, she wore a lot of African clothing. And so just, she was like a visual to me, mm -hmm. like, wow. You know, and so she kind of took this sort of African regal presence everywhere that she went. And so she would be going to all these places under any guise. Like, you know, we went to a prison under the idea of talking about money addiction. But she talked to people about domestic abuse because the reality was that the women were there not because they were addicted to money, but oftentimes they were, you know, in these relationships where they had taken the fall for their partner or, you know, were gotten involved in drugs. And, you know, the person who was supplying them, you know, threw them under the bus and all of these situations. And I feel like she was really able to talk to anyone, you know, um, on a human level and she had such a giving heart and to me she actualized like black feminism because it wasn't just this idea of let's read but it was like let's go out there and we're going to you know help these women we're going to listen to them we're going to let them lead us we're going to give them power you know we're just not sort of saviors but she launched so many interesting programs um, through that center she helped coordinate the counseling of the women, which may have, I think, maybe sparked this idea of the role of counseling and just sort of helping people feel or get to a sense of wholeness and how they can move in more political directions once they are there. But she really, I would say, helped me to find my voice, gave me confidence when I was unsure. She, um, yeah, she just would, you know, at a time where I was like reading off of index cards to talk to the public, she would just be like, tell them about your research. And I would be like, um, I'm not ready. She's like, you're ready. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need a little index card that says, you know, duh, 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 duh. just tell them why you're doing what you're doing, what you're doing and everything. 
and it helped me to just feel more of a sense of like I can do this I can talk to people um, people will hear me um, good intentions matter and that also I feel like you know she made it clear that everyone didn't have to do everything mm. that you know you could just do what you could do offer what you have you know because I think sometimes that ideal keeps us all like in frozen like I can't boycott yeah, everything. I'm, absolutely. you know, oh my gosh, yeah. I, I'm wearing the jeans, but I'm boycotting the food, and uh, it makes <laughs> like I shouldn't boycott the food because I'm wearing the jeans. She was just like, do what you, you know, everyone should just do what they can, mm-hmm. and share that, and then that will multiply. And you know that that was just a good lesson for me to learn. I met her in my early twenties. <laughs> wow, that's mm-hmm. wonderful. We have a ton more questions, but we need to be respectful of your time. Um, how much more time is it reasonable for you to give to this conversation? Well, it's a, a kind of a busy, busy, busy uh, afternoon, as I said, but I can talk for 10 more minutes, maybe one or two more questions. Well, we have a awesome. question that we ask everyone, but is it time for that? <laughs> no, let's not ask that one. Um, I'm oh, curious we're going about to. why... Uh, um, Fred Hampton wasn't more prominent in your book and whether you have something to say about the next level of leadership that uh, seems to be present in what he was doing in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, as a locally based study, you know, it was mainly the story of Oakland and Fred Hampton being in Chicago, but he did have such a huge, I think, impact. His stories also, I think, an interesting one to tie into our earlier co-optation conversation because there was a movie, Judas and the Black Messiah, which purported to bring Fred Hampton out to the public, but was really centered around the FBI agent. You could get a little drizzle of who he was and it certainly gave people spark to learn more, but you know, a lot was lacking there. I do feel like there was a lot of powerful and talented young leadership that was drawn to the Black Panther Party. People with the organi- organizing skills, people with the speaking skills, people with the political savvy, people who were willing to commit. When you think about what it meant to be part of the Black Panther Party, I mean, you didn't have like, no one gave you like a salary or people oftentimes had to give up, you know, even their clothing might be something that was became a collective possession, you know? And you had to accept that people were, and the organization was kind of dictating the logic of your day. And you had to accept all sorts of hierarchy, right? As an organization, the Panthers were pretty hierarchical. Um, So you had to accept that, um, whether you liked it or not. So um, I think because of those things, the, the leaders who were not centered in Oakland found the Panthers to be a hard organization to be part of in that way, right? Because Mm -hmm. the leadership was in Oakland, but the membership was nationwide. You could be a local leader, but it wasn't like there was a council of leaders and, you know, regional leaders and they went to Oakland and they all, you know, commute. Your level of voice could be um, dependent on your level of influence, um, etc. And of course, human beings, ego, jealousy, all of those things that sometimes make the fabulous, brilliant, bright local leader into somebody viewed as not just bright, beautiful and fabulous, but slightly threatening, you mm-hmm. know, to others. So there was, you know, a lot of human human wrangling, I think, within the organization and, and coming to terms with that. I think is key coming to an understanding of how those things do operate in social movements, I think is key as well. Well, with the Panthers, they were such a threat with their militant viewpoint that the COINTELPRO involvement and the, the, the literal mm-hmm. infiltration of them. And then later on, when um, that gentleman who was addicted and dot was shot in 1989, as you suggested, and I'm sorry, I'm forgetting his name right now. Um, 
there was a lot like the whole cocaine epidemic was targeted at black culture mm -hmm. and to, to keep it from gaining a foothold literally and changing the way this country operates. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you see that, you see that. That's why it's, again, it's not the personal failing, you know, the way that addiction operated within these political organizations and the Panthers are not unique. I mean, I think, this is the story of 70s political organizations where maybe we can say the trauma of incarceration, the, you know, all of those things made people vulnerable to these, you know, the ways in which the government was pumping illegal drugs into black communities, especially in California. Yeah. Have you historically seen any, groups form that have been very impactful without a military hierarchy involvement. Yeah, like SNCC, for example, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, they were known for being a very sort of horizontal organization. Um, they had a huge impact. Okay. Of course, they operated differently. Right. They were more program based um, there. They accepted a lot more individual autonomy from chapters and things like that. Um, they operated in a different context. So it's hard to say, you know, um, it's hard to say. Well, it's interesting. I've never heard of them. And of oh, course, yeah. I've heard of the Black Panther. So I think you have heard of them. Well, maybe maybe you haven't heard of them as them. So there's. Ella Baker, John Lewis. I'm sure you've seen him John on Lewis, television. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Those are members. People tend to talk about the organization as SNCC, but that's those people are associated with that. Okay. Greg and I have a musical question that we often ask the same. No, we always yet. ask. We. But always. I want to change it today. <laughs> no, I wanna... no, we got to ask the question. No, well, then we'll ask it after I ask this question. How's okay. that sound? That's good. <laughs> I think there's some real significant to the contribution of people of color into the musical reality of our culture. Mm -hmm. And particularly in the 50th year of the inception of hip hop and you being from Brooklyn, there's this aspect of who are the cultural heroes of hip hop that you identify? Like for me, KRS-One, steps out because of his method of educating people and speaking, you know, liberation to power. I'm wondering what you think are key aspects of hip hop relative to the nature of the conversation we're having and who are the artists that are that are making hay or making things happen? That's a great question. I have to say I am behind the times in um, in terms of, I guess, music engagement. So when you say KRS One, like that is where I am in hip hop, <laughs> like Queen Latifah, um, UNITY, like songs that sort of shifted the way you thought. Um, songs that could be armor, you know, in a hateful world. Yeah. I think those are the songs that I tend to um, gravitate towards. And sometimes those artists don't get the same kind of popular acclaim. Like I um, heard a hip hop artist, just Siri X, he's from Pittsburgh. He's an alternative um, hip hop artist. And he's got really great songs about Ferguson, about Palestine and things like that. So I tend to like those kinds of um, songs. I do feel like hip hop to me, is on that part of, again, our conversation about things that had a radical edge that might have been a little emptied or a lot emptied um, through commercialism, through um, murder of like T Tupac. I mean, yeah. he's the son of a through repression and um, violence and all of that. Yeah. And that one gets hard really quick because I think everyone wants to thrive and be f f fluent, fluent. And so, you know, if someone offers me X amount of money, 
there's a strong chance I'll take it, especially at this place in my life. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you know what I've, I've often thought? I feel like, and I thought this during um, Occupy Wall Street and the mm-hmm. whole narrative of the 1% and everything. I do feel like all of us can have what we need and even little luxuries. All of us. Yeah. With the redistribution of wealth. Right. You know, um, because so many people have so much. So few yeah. people, I should say, have so much. Yes. Right. Um, that it's conceivable. It's even dreamable. But I think we do have to conceive of it. Like, would I give up things if more people could have more? And, you know, it may be easy to make that, make that um, calculus. I mean, we walk by people eating off of the streets. I mean, when I came to California for the um, event, I was shocked. Although I had heard, I had seen, um, I had always been aware. I mean, the, the houselessness issue is so big. When I came there, I brought my daughter to the Bay Area for the first time. And it was there where I had to explain why people were living on the streets, eating out of the trash. And we were New Yorkers, but you just didn't see it in the same visceral way that you saw it there. And then I had the opportunity to go like down to LA and other places where you can really kind of see people living together under the freeways, things like that. Um, It's horrible. It's horrible. And I do believe the resources exist. Look at the military budget. Yeah. Please, yeah, resources, resources exist <laughs> to house everyone. They really do. The consciousness hasn't evolved <laughs> there yet. The cultural context has not been shifted. The, you know, we, we need to continue to speak truth to power, to challenge the norms that are ongoing, and to reflect, thankfully, f- to people like you through the lens of history to hold that mirror up to ourselves and be able to say, hey, am I doing enough today? What more could I be doing to shift things and to take responsibility and to be a beacon of hope as well as a cause for action? Mm -hmm. Well, I wanna thank you, Dr. Spencer Antoine, for being with us and uh, giving your time, really a gift And I do, I'm going to ask this very last question. Please take it with tongue in cheek, lightness. But this is our question. Okay. Eminem or Foo Fighters? Mm. (laughs) Eminem or Foo Fighters? Oh my gosh. (laughs) Eminem. (laughs) <laughs> All right. thank, thank you for that so so much for your grace and your time today just thank you so much i'm so excited to be in this space keep on keeping on this is a great program and good luck as you go forward thank you. recording stopped